You keep your Bibles at Ephesians chapter 4 and then also uh, look forward to going to Romans chapter 14. Our theme this morning is going to be in keeping with the verses that were just read, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Father, we ask for the ministry of the Spirit of God upon our minds and hearts that we would each one hear the word of the Lord and receive it and act upon it for your name's sake. And for this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A paraphrase of this verse says, I beg you, I, a prisoner in jail, for serving Christ. So this gives us a little context from which uh, the Apostle Paul is speaking. And he's exercised. Why would it be exercised that people in, in the church endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit? There must be something about human nature, even in, among Christians. We know we live in a, tur a turbulent world. Uh, world where there's all kinds of animosities. But when you become a Christian, you don't lose your capacity for that. And sometimes it can be even more exercised because sometimes we have a higher level of expectation from brothers and sisters or from a husband or a wife or children or parents. Because after all, we're Christians. And so it becomes a greater challenge. And so the call is not to go out and find unity. You have unity. Endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in all humility, gentleness, patience, and forbearing with one another. Making allowances for one another. I was thinking about this, and over the last 47 years plus, I've been privileged to serve here as a member of a congregation who, not with perfection, but has exhibited and continues to exhibit love and forgiveness and purity and unity and perseverance and many other manifestations of the Spirit of Christ. And there have been a few times when we had significant love and unity failures. But during these same 47 years, there are other congregations in the Middle Tennessee area who no longer exist. They're much larger, most of them are much larger than our church. They don't exist. Two Rivers Baptist Church in the Nashville area had thousands in attendance. They don't exist anymore. Belmont Heights, where Cindy and I went when we were in college, and where her mother played the organ and her father served in various capacities, no longer exists. Park Avenue, now there's, there's services in some of these churches, but the congregations that existed at that time and for years afterward, they, they're gone. Harvest Hills Baptist Church used to be the name of a building down the road here. Highland Park Baptist Church in Memphis, I mean in Chattanooga. Huge church. A college, a seminary. No longer exists over the same 47 year period. And to a great extent, There was disunity and love failures that ripped them apart. One of the great tragedies, if you read your newsletter this week, you saw this comment. One of the great tragedies is when Christians believe beautiful biblical truth and at the same time we produce the ugliness of lovelessness in relationships. It's devastating at home and at church, causing the Word of God to be blasphemed. 
So I would say to myself and to you, we must be on guard. We're capable of failure. It's with profound gratitude that I'm glad I can say that God has enabled a core group of saints in Christ in this place to simply keep on keeping their eyes on Jesus and are to put our eyes back on Jesus. So by the grace of God, there is even this day a sweet spirit in the assembly of the saints at Southside. But we've got to be careful so that we can adorn the gospel and make Christ visible to our mission field from here to the ends of the earth. In our homes and in our church, in other churches as well, many times the destruction is not wrought because there is major theological doctrines that people disagree on. Many times it's secondary issues. I don't know if there is a formal definition of secondary issues. Now, if, 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 if it's biblical, it's important. So when we say secondary, I'm not trying to suggest that it's not important. But I am saying that there are a number of doctrines about which you or I can be wrong and get to heaven anyway. We, uh, Cindy and I went through a period many years ago, we read some books and looked at some scriptures and we decided that for us, not in order to be more spiritual, not in order to uh, attain, attain some level of righteousness, but we decided to uh, honor the Old Testament laws concerning foods. So a lot of things that I grew up eating, I didn't eat anymore. And we made it plain to the congregation. And there were a few people, and I don't remember who, but there were some people who decided to do what we were doing because we were doing it. But then when others didn't do what they were doing because what is what we were doing, then they were upset because others weren't doing what they were doing. It never bothered us. Uh, we never tried to persuade anybody to do what we were doing. It was a secondary issue. And it's something we needed to apply to our own life and nobody else's. For many years, I've had the joy of having wonderful unity of spirit with brothers and sisters with whom I do not have uniformity. We can have unity in Christ without demanding or requiring uniformity. You dot all my I's, you cross all my T's, or else we can't fellowship. I hope you don't fall into that trap, but there are many people, and this happens in churches and homes all around, and you've got to be just like me, or else I'm not gonna be happy. And I'm gonna do my best to persuade you to be just like me. But I've had a number of, of years of good fellowship and, and unity. Now, I'm only speaking for myself because I can't talk for you. But I can look out here and there are people out here. I know that you and I are not exactly on the same page on some issues. And according to the Bible I read, not going to keep either one of us from, out of heaven. But if we don't respond correctly about this, we could cause havoc in the fellowship. But by the grace of God, that is not happening. But I'm just illustrating that it doesn't have to be a major thing for people to get all over the sorts. There are many families in their homes and they're just, on, they're just on pins and needles, lest somebody gets offended. Well, here we are told to Strive to maintain the unity of the Spirit. In meekness, gentleness, long-suffering, patience, 
bearing with one another in love and endeavoring to keep. It's a process. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now, at this point, go to Romans. Because in Romans chapter 14, we have examples of what seem to be very small matters. And talking about disagreements about food, about days of worship. And the Apostle Paul, again, was, was having to deal with this because it had become an issue. And these kinds of things still happen today. And so we go to this passage not primarily to talk about food and days to worship, but we're talking about how the Holy Spirit will show us how to respond to brothers and sisters who differ from us regardless of the issue. So in Romans 14, verse 1 and 2, receive one who is weak in the, flag, in the, in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes that he may eat all things, but he that is weak eats only vegetables. So the focus is on our responsibility toward the weaker brother or sister. Who is this weak person? Now look carefully at those two verses, because this is something that gets left out. He or she is one who is in the faith. That's the most important thing about this passage. We're talking about people who are in the faith, and we're exhorted to receive him, receive her. This is not uh, an option. This is a command from God. This is someone who's in, well, I don't believe he or she is in the faith. And that's the problem. You know, I've noticed that most of the people I talk to, they've got someone that they don't believe is in the faith. And I go to talk to that person, they say they don't believe they are in the faith. Uh, it's not a funny thing, but this is the sadness of looking at things the wrong way. Always wanting to look at the other person rather than looking at my own heart. But so the focus here is on our responsibility toward a weaker person, one who is in the faith. We are to receive that person. We are not to reject that person, receive him or her, because Christ has received them. How misguided can we be if we have a spirit of rejection towards someone whom Christ has received. I think I've told you before the account, supposedly, of Abraham. A stranger comes in. Abraham graciously says to his servants, take his camels and feed them and take care of them. And he brought this guy into his uh, a tent or whatever and fed him a big meal. And Abraham noticed that the, the guy did not give thanks before he ate. And Abraham kicked him out. The very idea, not giving thanks. And supposedly in this story, a little bit later, God spoke to Abraham. So where's the visitor I sent you away? Oh, yes, he came and I fed him. He did not even give you thanks, Lord. I kicked him out. And God said, I put up with him for many years. Can't you put up with him for one night? Are we more righteous than God? Having a judgmental spirit because someone is different than we are? They may be wrong. That's not the point. The point is, God is saying to me, how am I to treat them? The issue is not whether or not they're right or wrong. The issue is how am I going to treat them? Am I going, especially the brother or sister in Christ, am I going to treat them the way Christ does? He receives them. He commands us to receive each other. Saul of Tarsus had to learn a lesson. You remember that? In Acts chapter 9. After witnessing the, the martyrdom of Stephen, Saul of Tarsus got worse. He went out beating up on Christians and having them 
thrown in jail and who knows what all happened to them. And when God got Saul's attention, he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now, wait a minute. Jesus is in heaven. Saul is on earth. How can he persecute Jesus? The way you treat a Christian is the way you treat Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less. The issue is not what they have or have not done or what they believe or what they don't believe. The issue is, am I treating that person in a spirit of reception the way Jesus is? Now, again in Romans chapter 14, verse 1, the latter part of verse 1, here is how not to receive the weaker person. Don't receive them in a spirit of doubtful dispensations. Many have looked at that and said, here is the issue here. Do not receive the weaker believer for the purpose of having a big dispute and quarrel. I'm going to receive him, but I'm going to straighten him out. We need to leave the servants of the Lord alone. God can take care of his children. We need to focus on what he's saying to us. Romans 14, 2, one man's faith allows for him to eat anything, while a man of weaker faith eats only vegetables. 3 and 4, let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. Let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. The strict Christian finds it easy to write off his brother as an unspiritual, meat-eating, pig-eating compromiser. The free Christian finds it easy to regard his brother as an uptight legalist. You're just a legalist. The strong believer, the tendency would be to despise a weaker brother, to hold him in contempt. You foolish vegetarian. How can you be so doctrinally weak? Don't you know that in Christ we can eat anything we want to? Oh, let's be honest here. We don't usually have those conversations directly. We have it in our spirit and we have it with our best buddies. That's okay, right? No. No. The weak brother's tendency would be to judge and criticize or condemn the strong believer. You're just an unscriptural pig-eating compromiser. No, he's your brother. And Christ has received him. God has graciously received every believer. And because of this, we are to receive them, whether weak or strong. We either have a spirit of rejection or a spirit of reception toward the people in our world. Uh, Jack Taylor many years ago wrote a book, One Home Under God. Let's apply this for a second to husband and wife. He had a chapter in the book about receiving and rejecting. And he had a proclamation of reception, a husband's proclamation of reception. Father, in Jesus' name, I now receive my wife. I accept her as she is, a gift from you. I receive the fact that every quality in her is aimed at perfecting a quality in me. Being a gift from you, she is perfect, holy, and without blame before you in love. And I love her because I love you. And I declare that love to be absolutely unconditional. No quality in her will deter or discourage that love. She is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She is what I need to be complete. Thank you, Father, that in your perfect wisdom you have given her to me. I happily and heartily receive her. Forgive me for rejecting her at any point and causing conflict through complaining. I cannot reject her at any point in this matter, for to do so would be to reject a part of me and to reject you. I will continue in this disposition regardless of what happens. In Jesus' name. Proclamation of a wife's proclamation of reception. 
Father, in Jesus' name, I now receive my husband. He's God's gift to me. Forgive me for putting more emphasis on what he is not rather than on what he is. I receive him as my Lord, my life, my keeper, my head. He is what I need to be productive and purposeful. I give thanks over every problem and potential affirming that these exist to be used of God to work out his plan in me. I have taken his name instead of mine. I now receive him. I celebrate that reception with praise and thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Is this necessarily easy? Oh, our flesh will scream. And there can be great persecution coming either from a wife or from a husband. But we're talking about doing what we do as an act of worship to the Lord and leaving our spouse or anyone else to the Lord. In verse 4, the verse is instructing the person who judges his fellow believer because of what he eats. The one judging needs to realize that he is not this man's master or Lord. He's a fellow servant, fellow slave, fellow believer. A servant is responsible to his master only, and the master is the only one who has the right to judge him. And of course, the believer's master is the Lord himself. Life becomes much simpler when we take our hands off of that which is not our responsibility and trust Jesus. Continuing in verse 4 and 5, one person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes a day observes it to the Lord. He who does not observe, observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats to the Lord, he who eats, eats unto the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. Now, as to which day, the New Testament is not totally straightforward with a command. You must worship on Saturday or you must worship on Sunday. There are strong teachings that we can uh, we probably, everyone would lean the same way on this, but the statement here is that there is not a direct command. Notice at the end of verse 5, let every man be fully persuaded, fully convinced, certain and assured in his own mind. It's not that these things don't matter. It's not that they're unimportant. The Spirit is not saying, it doesn't matter what you eat, doesn't matter what days you observe. He says that every believer should be convinced in his own mind. It doesn't say I'm supposed to convince you. But I need to be convinced that I'm doing what I'm doing because I honestly believe before God is what God says. And so... I'm settled with God on this. Right or wrong, you're in a different place. I'm going to leave you with God. That's not my business. Verse 5, not only should the believer be fully persuaded, but notice in verse 6, we should do what we do to the Lord. Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men, knowing that the Lord of the Lord you shall receive the reward of inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do it for the glory of the Lord. So this principle is larger than just eating and drinking. On these kinds of things, secondary issues, and even on primary issues, uh, we can be absolutely convinced that we have the truth and uh, be of absolute no value in the kingdom of God. How would you like to have 
all knowledge. You're something close already. I don't see any of you with that spirit. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, wouldn't that be something? If someone stood up here and began to speak in air, name a language, you go, go to town. Wow. Got an interpreter. It, we're not talking in tongues at this point, but just you don't know if it's a language or not. Oh, yes, that's, that's my language. And it just, wow. Or I have the gift of prophecy. And I understand all mysteries. Man, there are things in the Bible, there are mysteries, and I wish I understood them. And here you are, and you understand all mysteries. Not some mysteries, all of them. And all knowledge. And you have faith. You can remove mountains. And you're very generous. You, re you bestow your goods to the poor. You feed the poor. You're willing to give your body to be burned. You can have all that, but if you don't have love, you're a zero. That's what God says. Have you ever noticed that when we get into confrontations, whether it's in the church or whether it's in the home, the first thing that goes out the window is love. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, they, they're not loving. No, 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 not, not talking about they, not, not, not talking about them, talking about here. God's always pointing here. They is his business. Now, Chapter 14 continues, verse 7 through 9. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live unto the Lord, and if we die, we die unto the Lord. And therefore, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. That's the bottom line this year. We are the Lord's. I need to look in the mirror. I belong to the Lord. He has a right to be glorified in my spirit, in my actions, my words, my attitudes, whatever. He's my master. I'm his slave. We're to magnify him, whether by living or by dying. Now, in Romans 14, 10 through 12, this thing gets even more serious. But why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Then shall each of us give account for himself to God. This is talking about judgment just for believers. This is what is called the judgment seat of Christ. What's the point? Why am I judging my brother? Or my wife? I'm not the judge. Christ is. He's going to judge me. He's going to judge everyone, but my concern must be he's going to judge me. Be concerned about ourselves so that we might receive his well done. Now, yes, we know that ultimately the whole human race is going to be judged. It's a radical difference. That's, uh, there are people here, maybe even here today, you're not saved, you're not in Christ, and if you die in that state... At the great white throne judgment, your eternal sentence will be pronounced and it will be judgment and punishment for eternity. Flee to Christ. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But in Romans 14, the focus is upon believers at the judgment seat of Christ. And notice in verse 10, 11, and 12 that he's talking about every believer. We shall all, verse 10, Every knee, verse 11. Every tongue, verse 11. Every one of us, verse 12. Every one of us shall give an account of himself. Lord, I'd like to give account of my wife. You, you might have missed a few things. No. Or that preacher down there, or that deacon, or that Sunday school teacher, or whatever. 
No. When God, when Jesus judges you at the great judgment seat of Christ for believers, let's just be honest, we're not going to bring up anybody else at that point. But if you did, you would not get a hearing. We must give an account of ourselves. We have to confess our own sin. That's, that's what we're to do now anyway. First John 1 John 1.9. We're to confess our own sins. And so in chapter 14, verse 13, he says, Therefore let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or to cause to fall, or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Don't judge your brother, judge yourself. I think these verses are pretty clear. Verse 14 and 15, I know and I'm convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean in itself, but to him who considers anything unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you're no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Paul says, hey, I've got this directly from the Lord in my communication and fellowship with him. I can eat anything. The Lord himself persuaded, Jesus, persuaded Paul. The Lord Jesus Christ. I am persuaded by the Lord Jesus. Well, how can Jesus persuade one of one thing and one of another? I don't understand that. You're on the wrong question. We always like to slide away from the right question. The only question is, what is God saying to me? Stop all your foolish questions. Where did Cain get his wife? There's a thousand questions we'd love to talk about rather than allowing the Spirit of God to pinpoint our hearts. Well, but in this passage here, there's something very interesting. What can make a food unclean? When a person believes a food to be unclean, then to him it is unclean. To him. And if you're eating and you know that he has that, you don't flaunt and say, I'm glad I'm not in bondage like you are. You need to grow up. No, you love your brother. You don't flaunt your liberty at the expense of your brother. Again, we're not talking about sins like adultery and covetousness and gluttony and slander and evil speaking and all the works of the flesh like in Galatians 5. All those things are sin, period. period. But here in chapter 14, Verse 15, if your brother is grieved because of your food, you're no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Don't ruin your brother. The thing here is not for me to flaunt my liberty, but for me to care for the soul of my brother. God is serious about our manifesting, showing Christ to others, especially in the household of faith. None of this relates to what goes on out in the world. It's the household of faith. Now, nothing in this passage gives the weaker brother the right to try to place the other one in their restrictions. It goes both ways here. Verse 16 through 18, Therefore do not let your good be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Now we're down to the core essence of what we need to be focused on. And the Christian life is all about righteousness and joy and peace in everything. Righteousness we are clothed in the perfect righteousness of Christ. 
that's not the focus here. The focus here is the righteousness that is outflowing of our being in Christ that which is right, that which is good, that which is holy. And whenever we're walking in tune with the Spirit, we may have all kinds of opposition and troubles coming from the outside, coming even from those who are close to us. But when we are walking in the Spirit and walking with Jesus, you know what we'll have? Joy. You see, I don't need to be moaning and groaning about how this one doesn't agree with me on this and that one and I can't be happy if you're not this way and if you're not that way. I need to be focusing, Lord, your will and your provision for me is even through my tears to have your joy. Joy unspeakable. Lord Jesus, I, I'm suffering and I'm in trouble, but I, I've never had the trouble and, and difficulty to the extent that Jesus had when he was here and no one or nothing could steal his joy. And I've let my joy be stolen. Labor hard, endeavor hard this coming week to get your joy back. It's God's will for you. It's God's provision for you. It's the fruit of the Spirit in you. You're not look, look, looking under a rock. You're talking about ungrieving and unquenching the Spirit. And nobody has to change it. So I, just, I need to allow the Spirit of God to change me. I still may have tears and troubles and trials, but I've got joy. And I'm walking in righteousness and peace. In verse 18, these things take us back to the previous verse, which talks about the righteousness, the perfect righteousness of Christ, the joy and the peace that we have in him. God is delighted and well pleased when his children are, as, Galatians, or as Ephesians 5.18 says, walking in obedience to the command there to be ye being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a process. Every day we have to work on that. Be ye being filled. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's your source for strength and power to win over all the bad stuff. To be manifesting the fruit of the Spirit and not the works of the flesh. Meditate deeply on Galatians 5, 19 through 23. And tell yourself over, don't look at verses 19 to 21 and say, yeah, that's the way this one is, that's the way this one is, that's what this one does, that's what this one does. Uh, they did this, they did. No. Lord, these things are not to be in my life. End of story. And Lord, I'm going to die to all of my excuses for having let them be in my life. I'm going to take on the uh, concept of Ephesians 4, put off the old man. Works of the flesh are old man. That's the way I used to be. And I may have just done it. Lord, that was wrong. It was against you. I have no excuse. It was wrong. It doesn't manifest your spirit. It does not speak of righteousness. It does not manifest joy. I refuse it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm no longer a slave to that. In Christ, I have deliverance from the old life. I'm no longer a pawn for anybody. I'm a child of God. And putting off the old man, I've been given love, joy, peace, the nine expressions of his fruit in our lives. There in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Spend time in the Word. Spend time before the Lord, crying out to the Lord. I, I don't have much experience in these verses, Lord, but this is the fruit of your, your Spirit. And if it's not in my life, the only reason it would not be in my life is I am grieving your Spirit. I can't blame any of you because of some of that or much of that is not in my life. You know, that is wonderful good news. If my having the fruit of the Spirit is dependent on the way you treat me, I'm in trouble. Because you'll treat me one day one way and another day the next. And so will I you. But the fruit of the Spirit is not dependent on anybody else. 
It wasn't for Jesus, and it's not for us. But I'm not Jesus. I know that. But he lives within you by his Holy Spirit. To do in and through you all that he did when he was here. That's one of the great reasons why he came, is to model how to live the Christian life. And he said, without my Father, I could do nothing. Through my Father, I can do all things. Without my Father, I don't speak. I don't do anything. But through him. So then, in 19 through 21, he says, therefore, let us pursue. This is not just a piece of cake. Sign the dotted line. Don't have to worry about it. Pursue the things which make for peace. And things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food or for the sake of anything else. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything. This principle is not just about food and, and the day of the week. He says it's good not, neither to eat meat or drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. We all have a responsibility not to straighten out brothers and sisters, but to be used of the Lord to edify brothers and sisters. Don't tear down, build up. Verse 21, building up our brother is more important than eating and drinking. Anything is universal application. Well, I honestly think that there's enough here in Ephesians uh, three, Ephesians four one through three, in the, in the, the chapter of, of Romans fourteen, to bring about a great awakening, a great new joy in the lives of everyone who is sitting here. To be alert to some of the most dan dangerous enemies you have. Have you thought lately about how much so many of the epistles deal with attitudes? There's a reason. That's where we stumble. Probably none of us are going to go out from here this week and do some big bad sin. That the world calls big bad, or that the scriptures tell I me, mean, how in the world? But there's a thousand attitudes and actions and words that we speak that don't edify, that don't build up. The tongue's fire set on like of hell. The book of James is very strong on this. This is not about anybody who's not here, it's not about anybody who is here, it's only about me. You say, well, isn't that selfish? No, I need to get me right. Seminary students at Southwestern some years ago had an assignment to go, go any of the churches in the, in the Fort Worth, Dallas area and sit down with the pastor, get an appointment, sit down with the pastor and in, interview them. So two guys went to this particular church, well-known pastor. He graciously received them. And the student said, sir, what is the most important thing you do every day? And this pastor didn't flinch. He looked them straight in the eye and he said, take care of me. Well, what a self-centered, you don't even qualify to be in the pulpit. Take care of me. What, what do you? And he went on to explain. He didn't linger too long because he, he could see their startled face. He said, if I don't take care of my walk with the Lord, if I don't take care to keep short accounts and to not let sin get in my life, if I don't take care to walk in the steps of Jesus, I have nothing to give to anybody. It's not just for pastors. It's for all of us. Our Father, we bless you for giving us your word. Help us, O oh Father, to receive your word. Oh, Father, we bless you for the power of the Spirit of God. You're going to be leading us afresh and anew in powers of righteousness. 
for your name's sake, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here this morning, there's something on your heart, you need to deal with the Lord, deal straight to heaven. You may need to set up an appointment. You may need to respond in an invitation. You may be here outside of Christ, and you want to, you're moved by the Spirit of God, I want to confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Whatever God is saying, just obey him as we sing.